the F-14 Tomcat, caged lightning with million dollar missiles and a Vulcan 20 millimeter cannon. You'll need every ounce of firepower this plane can offer for your current mission. For this episode, we need to go back, then forward, before we can actually go back again and examine the game in today's spotlight. This particular game series is somewhat confusing with the release on arcade versus the home conversions, so bear with me while I try to make sense of all this. July 1987 saw the release of a brand new arcade experience, developed by Sega's premier studio, Sega AM2, with development led by Sega mastermind Yu Suzuki. Afterburner came screaming onto the floor and took the Japanese market by storm. Afterburner brought many innovations for the time, most notably the cockpit you would sit in, which featured fully rotational design that went along with movements in the game. Also, technically speaking, brought forward some much needed progression in 3D scaling and rotation thanks to a newly minted Sega X board. Then shortly after, received a home conversion to the Sega Master System, also titled Afterburner. Unfortunately, it was a very watered down, neutered version, but it was the best that could be done for the time as the Master System was all that there was available. Things progressed very quickly in the 80s with arcade games and an update to Afterburner, dubbed Afterburner 2, was already primed and dropped only a few months later onto Japanese arcade floors in October of 1987. Also developed by Sega AM2, comprising of the same team as previous title, led also by Yu Suzuki. Now here's where it starts to get confusing. The best version of Afterburner for home consoles that came to American stores was Afterburner for 32X. But Afterburner on 32X is actually a home conversion of Afterburner 2. The 32X conversion was handled by Rotubo Games and published by Sega. In other markets, it is titled as Afterburner Complete, since most felt that the updates added to the sequel were more polished refinements to the existing game versus an outright continuation in the series. Now, 1988 saw the release of the Sega Y board, which offered a third CPU that helped in rendering, scaling, and rotation of on screen sprites, but in real time. The fourth game to be released with this hardware was G Lock Air Battle, which was an acronym for G Force Induced Loss of Consciousness, and that uh, came out in April 1990. G Lock was more a spiritual successor to Afterburner than an actual direct sequel. But since the gameplay is somewhat similar, it usually gets lumped in. Also developed by Sega AM2 with development also led by Yu Suzuki. The major difference in G-Lock is the game is from a cockpit perspective instead of a third person view that was cemented with Afterburner. Also another major difference is it's more like Hang On or Outrun and that you have checkpoints that have to be met to refill your time meter. For instance, the first wave you have 8 enemies to shoot down and have 70 seconds to do it. The quicker you do it, you get a time bonus, and that carries over to the next round and compounds your time, and so on and so forth. When you run out of time, it's game over. This was given multiple home conversions and ports, featured here as a Sega Genesis port handled by Probe Software. But there were also ports for essentially every single gaming PC of the late 80s known to man, it seemed. Now, 1991 saw the final Sega Wideboard offering, and yet another Sega AM2 release in Strike Fighter, which is a sequel to G-Lock Air Battle. Departing from the formula of its predecessor, Strike Fighter instead focuses on similar gameplay as Afterburner, which is shoot anything that moves and avoid being shot. Now, Strike Fighter was never released to home consoles and has forever languished in the annals of arcade history. Or has it? Now this is where things get even more odd. Strike Fighter actually has received a home console conversion, sort of. First release in Japan 1992, then to American Shores March of 93 on the Sega CD, 
conversion development handled by CRI Middleware Company Limited, then known as CSK Research Institute Corporation, Afterburner 3 is actually just a renamed port of Strike Fighter. There are a few options added to this to make it more like an Afterburner game, most prominent being that you can go to options and choose a third person point of view, as the arcade only had a cockpit view. Unless you're being tailed, then it would zoom out for those instances. The thing about Strike Fighter to me is it is by far the most difficult game out of all the Afterburner Expanded Universe titles to get the crosshair squarely on a target and land your shots. And the same difficulty and challenge is carried over to Afterburner 3 as well. I can literally go several waves in a row without shooting a single target at all if I squarely rely on the Vulcan. It seems the plane is slower to move to target and the lock-on, while effectively locking on, the shots aren't actually landing. Now the missile becomes your friend in this instance, as the missiles seem to take out the lock-on targets, but you need to conserve your missiles as best as you can, so it's a struggle between do I shoot, evade, or hurl a rocket. Thankfully this does not impede the overall progression of the game, because the object to me is more or less to survive. So your objective could be defense, not offense, and you could still win which is a complete departure from G-Lock, as the entire game is squarely shoot these targets in this amount of time. Development for Afterburner 3 was led by Chief Programmer Toro Kujurai, which you may have recognized that name as they also programmed for the Genesis port of Galaxy Force, and they were the director and chief programmer for Sega Touring Car Championship for the Saturn, and also director for Arrow Wings for the Dreamcast, among several other games to note. Sound effects for this game are handled by Cube Corporation, and they have a working list a mile long of sound design they have contributed. Most notably, Shining Force 2, Sonic the Hedgehog 3, Virtua Fighter 2, Lunar the Silver Star, and a metric ton of other great titles. In-game credits attribute the in-game music to Soul.Inc. tried to find some additional information on them, but I came up to only dead ends. But at the end of the day, it's quite a banger of a soundtrack, regardless of which. So whether you are a longtime fan of Afterburner series like myself, or a fairly newcomer, be sure to give Afterburner 3 a go for at least a few minutes. Then after you've gotten a few game overs, you can head over to Afterburner for 32x and enjoy the absolute apex of arcade enjoyment for hours to come. Do I think Afterburner 3 is a bad game? Well, no, not at all. It's enjoyable for what it is. But my overall take is the 8-bit and 16-bit consoles just could not do these games or fair justice without sharp compromises to the overall gameplay. It wasn't until we could harness 32-bit processing that these games really started to shine. But they are what they are and should be enjoyed and viewed within that perspective. Or, you know, you could always just fire up MAME and enjoy them on your PC the way they were originally meant to be enjoyed.